Now that made me think. Perhaps I shall write seven poems because it really made me think. <laughs> you never know, Terry. Uh, you always make me think. <laughs> and we're going to now bring up, just before, Hendrick's coming up, not next, but after next. And next is somebody who I really respect and I love their poetry very much too. I love everything they write. They are sort of like, to me, when we all die and go to heaven, they're going to be the one in charge. <laughs> so please come up, Andrew Parkin, and please put your hands together to welcome lovely Andrew Parkin. That's okay? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, thanks very much for that nice introduction, Candice. Your turn. Um, I'm, I'm going to read, I'm going to read from a novel here, because it's got, it, it's in prose, of course, but it, there's a passage of prose poetry here and there in the novel, and this is a little bit of prose poetry, and it's from when I lived in Hong Kong, <coughs> beg your pardon, something that's based on a real incident, it actually happened to me. I had reached Nathan Road and was waiting at the pedestrian crossing when I saw her standing on the narrow island in the middle of the road waiting like me for the walk sign to glow green. She was a tall, dark-skinned woman of supreme and compelling beauty. Her features were fine-boned and regular, her nose narrow and straight, her lips pleasingly full. Her dark, steady gaze had a force that allowed no escape. My eyes met hers, and perhaps from timidity or maybe good manners, I looked away. I felt compelled, though, to catch her eyes again. I looked at her. Her eyes met mine again. This time she was surely staring at me, unsmiling, intent, her eyes larger, opened wider. She raised her left hand and arm in front of her face and made a serpentine gesture, neither beckoning nor repelling, but simply sliding snake-like down in front of her neck and body. I was fascinated by this woman, enchanted by her dignity, her poise, her beauty, the elegance of her dark clothes, and most of all, the strange gesture. She repeated it, still looking me in the eye, calm, unsmiling. It was a signal, but its meaning escaped me. I'd never seen such a gesture before. It seemed natural to her, and yet part of her mystery. Her gravity and, yes, hieratic beauty suggested some ancient ritual of a forgotten culture. Perhaps, too, she was a memory in me of the exalted female figures in Gustave Moreau's sketches and paintings. The small green light for pedestrians glowed in the crossing signal. And I walked toward the little space left by the pedestrians coming towards me. The tall, dark woman stood still as a statue as I approached. I was now just a yard in front of her. She was not a Chinese, not a Filipina, not an African, not an Indian, not a European. I detected neither race nor country in her, just the most exquisite mixture of sculptural repose. As I got level with her, she turned so that she was close beside me, facing the direction I was taking, and slipped her slender left arm through my right one, resting a slender hand on my right hand. I stopped and glanced down at her long brown fingers 
nails meticulously manicured and painted alternatively, alternately silver and gold. She turned her head towards me and speaking gravely in a low voice asked, where are you going? She had no distinguishing accent. I didn't speak. My blood was racing. Again, she posed her question, where are you going? I smiled, gazing into her deep brown eyes, almost animal in their beauty. Where are you going? I replied. Immediately, I felt my words were foolish and trivial. Her words, though the same, seemed to pose a real and an urgent question reaching into the secrets of my life and all its circumstances. She was startlingly different from any other human being I had met. Moreover, she spoke with the air of knowing me already. And the rest is fiction. <laughs>